hi, I'm Tara. I just finished my final year of aerospace engineering at the University of Birmingham. Um, today, I'm just going to tell you a bit, a bit about my reason to engineering, um, types of modules and research that I've done in my degree, um, a placement opportunity that I undertook, and types of jobs you can get from engineering. So, my route in, into engineering, as with everything, it's not always a straight line. Um, so started off with my GCSEs, then I did my A-levels, I did maths, further maths and physics. Um, they're really good ones for engineering and a degree. Um, I think most degree engineering degrees want maths and a science subject, and usually they're a bit more lenient on the third subject, but it's definitely really important to just double check um, what they say as well. So I then applied to the different universities and got my offers. I then came to UAB back in 2018 now, um, which was really good fun. And um, it was also the same year that Josh started as well. Um, so after my second year, I planned to do a year abroad in Australia. Due to COVID, this got cancelled. Um, so then I decided to do my third year. After my third year, I then planned to do a year abroad in Vietnam. Again, because of COVID, that got cancelled again. Um, this time I decided I didn't want to do my master's straight away, um, purely because there weren't going to be a lot of people going into the master's year, and there would only be enough people for one group project, and the one group project would be on an electric plane, which I'd already realised that I was more interested in the space side of aerospace. So I decided to take a leave of absence and have a year out. Um, this was a bit all over the place. Um, most placement year applications had been and gone. Everyone had already started them. So I worked as a waitress for a bit and then I managed to get a job kind of as admin, um, random jobs in a primary school, um, taught a bit of PE, um, lots of school trips, which was very good fun. Um, but a lot of emailing companies just sending my CV out, kind of nicely begging for them to give me anything that I could do. Um, thankfully, a few companies got back to me. Some of them weren't able to offer me anything, but I got lots of really good contacts in the sector I want to work in. Um, and then one company did get back to me and offered me a six month placement. Um, and that is something that a lot of university engineering degrees offer a placement year. I'd say they're really good experience and it helps you learn what you do want to do and what you don't want to do as well. So then after my placement, I've just done my master's year and then graduating. And then I've decided I want another year out to travel a bit because it's what I've tried to do and it's not happened. So I'm currently applying to go to Canada for a ski season and during that time I'll be applying for a grad scheme hopefully and then we'll start going into a job and getting some money as well. Um, so types of modules that you can do on an aerospace degree. So you've got the space side and then you've got kind of plane flight. Um, uh, our first year at Birmingham is the same across all types of engineering. So if you do decide you want to switch, then you all have a common first year and it doesn't matter. Um, there is quite a good split here on um, space and plane flight, um, but I personally quickly realised which one I was more interested in. And it usually does show in your grades which one you're more interested in. Um, that's not a surprise. Um, but there's such a wide variety and I know here at UAB they're constantly changing some um, modules just to make them more up to date with what's going on in the world and also just to have more specialist lecturers involved as well, which is really good to see that it's constantly developing. So types of projects that you can do. Um, in my third year, I did a dissertation, which is a quarter of your year. And I focused it on space debris, looking at low Earth orbit and a different orbit called the Molniya orbit. 
and looking at the types of satellites in them and the difference in debris. I also looked at the Starlink satellites and what would happen if we lowered um, the altitude that they're at or if we increase the altitude that they're at and what difference would happen to the debris. Um, as you can see, it has been increasing over time. That's obviously not unsurprising due to the amount of increase in launches and also satellites being put up into the air. Um, so then in my master's year, we do a group project, which is a third of your degree, a third of your final year. And um, I did the space project, um, which was to design a small sat payload bus and this was linked with a company called InSpace. It was really good to have kind of external company feedback. And this is something that they're actually working on in their company. So they were really interested in what we were coming up with. For our final design, they said we got it to a lower weight than they had. And hopefully we had actually done that right and it wasn't a false value. Um, but they managed to get some of their um, mechanical engineers in on our call. Um, we had an additive manufacturer speak to us. Um, the help and expertise that we got through this project was really good. Um, the project also helps you look at kind of project management, um, the requirements needed, different materials, different manufacturing methods, um, computer-aided design and testing and verification at the end and also looking at how much it would actually cost to build this. And that's looking at person time, um, manufacturing, materials, training time. I looked at the costing for bringing, having the manufacturing in-house um, for additive manufacturing. So that would be buying all the machines, buying all the gas, buying aircon, buying heating. So it's quite a lot of different things to think about. Um, but you split it between your team and as long as you're organised, like, it is a very doable thing. Um, but that's just like really the tip of the iceberg on like the types of projects you can do with an engineering degree. Um, just briefly, a few iterations of our design, uh, looking at reducing the thickness, using generative design and then optimising it. We optimise it for mass, which is what the customer requirement was. Um, but throughout the process, it is a lot of looking back at the requirements and reminding yourself what you're trying to optimise. And you're not just designing something and going, yeah, there we go, I've sorted it. Um, at the end, obviously, there was still more we could do, but that is with any engineering project. There's always more you could do, but you need to kind of work out what point is a good enough point because you should spend years on something but that's not very good for the company if they're paying someone to do years of work on just the one thing that's quite small um, so engineering problems can be ongoing but to be a good engineer it's working out what's the best point to stop um, and like I could make it better but not that much better. Um, this was some of the finite element analysis that we did on our structure as well, looking to see if it met the requirements and if it could withstand the environment that it was in. Um, we then also got to use the 3D printer that we have at the school um, to try and see what it would look like. This also closely resembled um, additive manufacturing, which was the process we decided to use. Um, so placement opportunities, um, so back in year 12, I did two work experience placements and um, both one week. I did one with Airbus and one with Mott McDonald's. Um, so I didn't really know what I wanted to do when I was in sixth form. I don't think most people do. Um, I just knew that I did maths and science and someone did just say to me, why don't you look at engineering? And I had no other ideas, so I just thought, yeah, that's good enough for me, I'll have a look. 
Um, so I applied to lots of different work experiences. I luckily managed to get the one at Airbus and that was just one week in my half term. And that for me is what kind of made it aerospace. So it was in Broughton, which is where they make all the wings for the Airbus planes. And just to see kind of the hand that they're all kept in, going up really close to them, learning about all the different parts of the wing. For me, weirdly, now I'm more interested in space. Um, planes at the time are, were what solidified aerospace for me, um, but obviously that has changed. Um, I then did a week with Mott McDonald, who were more civil engineering, and it was fun, but I did realise that that definitely wasn't what I wanted to do. Um, so my placement last year was with DSTL, who are um, part of the Ministry of Defence. So I got to work on some really exciting projects. Um, a lot of it is kind of, it was a bit weird because some of it you can talk about this, you can't talk about that. And I was just walking around like, I'm still a student, how am I? able to work on all of this some of the projects I was on some of the grads were jealous that I was on it and were confused as to how I was doing it um but I just asked around when I was there um so I managed to work on a bit about hypersonic capabilities of the UK um which we presented at the Farnborough Air Show and I'm there next to a model of it um and a concept model because it will probably look different um, and then I got to work with the space team which is what I really enjoyed um, it was only two days a week but it was more hands-on building um, and it was this CubeSat that you can see on the screen um, as you can see the clean bench was tiny you whack your head on it nearly every day um, but they were the company were trying to see how much in-house building they could do um, with so little and to be able to build this um, was really interesting um, I they, it was such a small team I think there was five of us and because there weren't many of us I became a subject matter expert on harnesses which is again I was never a big fan of electrical modules but that really helped me in like being able to do the research and like they were coming to me to ask the questions. And I think that's something that's really valuable with a placement. Like you kind of get to do a lot more than you thought you would and you learn a lot quicker, um, which is probably something that made me reflect on going to university and think maybe I should have done a degree apprenticeship. Um, but then I'd think again and think, no, I definitely knew I wanted to go to university. Um, I wanted the university experience. Um, so I, I know I definitely chose the right thing for me. And I think being able to do a placement within it um, made it a good, a good balance of what I wanted. Um, so just briefly, the types of jobs you can go into. Um, so here at UAB, Aerospace Engineering is in the School of Metallurgy and Materials. And materials engineers are really sought after in the, these types of sectors. Um, so F1, if that's what you're interested in, in um, autonomous cars, um, electrical and um, space project managers software, structural, uh, mechanical, electrical and materials. The jobs available to you with engineering are endless. A lot of them probably might not be created. Um, the ones that you end up with uh, probably don't exist. Um, but that is because technology is constantly developing. And it's a very exciting sector to be in. And it is difficult to keep up. A lot of people say, oh, have you seen this? And you're like, no, not heard of it at all. But then you might know something they don't. And to have something that's so rapidly evolving is really exciting. And then 
it doesn't also build your math skills and lots of things like that it builds your soft skills as well there's a lot of group projects there's a lot of time management skills um and i think that is one thing that engineering is really good with you start off having quite a few contact hours in first year and from there you really learn how how you learn yourself as well um and then they drop off and there's a lot more personal study time but it's all about how you balance your life and your learning um at university i've been part of a sports team um, and i think that's helped me balance it as well but i've also been an ambassador for aerospace engineering and for sport and fitness and i think having more things on helps me dedicate a certain amount of time to my work each week instead of just thinking i've got all day to do this um, but that is a very quick summary of aerospace and the things that I've done. Um, I think kind of the main thing you need to think about is if you want to come to like try and work out if university is right for you or whether it's a degree apprenticeship. Um, both you get a degree, but they're just different ways of learning. If you're more hands on, maybe an apprenticeship um but again there's hands-on experiences um with at university and um, there's a society called formula students formerly a student and that's where they build an f1 car and they race it at the end of the year and they make a new one every single year and so if that's what you're interested in there is something for that i think again that's one of the things university is really good for there will be something that you're interested in. And if there isn't, you can create it. I think the opportunities available, it will be biased because this is the route I've taken, but the opportunities available at university are, are brilliant. And you make lots of different friends with people in different years on different courses. And I think that also helps a lot of your soft skills as well and to develop you as a person. But that is also the same on a degree apprenticeship as well. That's so great, Tara, that's grown. Thank you so much. We'll come to Q&A afterwards, but um, I know that uh, I'm, we've already had some pre-asked questions that I shall read out, but students, if you'd like to get tapping away as, uh, as um, Josh is speaking, please do, and we'll answer those at the end. Tara, thank you ever so much. I'm going to hand over to Josh now, um, and then we'll come back to you in a very short while. Thank you very much. Okay, so can you guys hear me okay? Yep, no problems, that's grand. Thank yeah. you, Josh. Brilliant, okay. Uh, so, hi everyone, uh, my name's Josh. So, I've just, well, last summer I finished uh, my aerospace engineering degree. I did a master's, uh, same as Tara, and I'm currently a part of Serene. So, this is a research group at the University of Birmingham, and it's called the Space Environment and Radio Engineering Group. So very related to aerospace, also a little bit not. So uh, I'll talk through this as well. So I'm going to talk about what is aerospace engineering and where can it take you? So I'm going to try and answer the questions that I think would have been really useful for me when I was making the decision uh, during college, because I know my perception of aerospace engineering when I started was very different to what it is now. So before I start as well, I should probably say there's going to be a be a little bit of overlap with what Tara said. So I'm going to try and go about it with a slightly different direction. So bear with me if there's a bit of overlap. So this is just an overview of the questions I'm going to try and answer here. So first of all, why would you want to do aerospace engineering? This is a question, if you're considering it, you probably want to ask yourself, why do you want to do it? And also what sort of expectations do you have going into aerospace engineering? And based on them, what actually is it? Because I didn't have a clue what it actually entailed, like my perceptions of it were very different to what the reality is. And then I'm also going to answer, what is an aerospace engineer? What do you do? And, and then on to the more exciting part, how do you put all of what you've learned to good use? And then the more scary question is, where do you go after university? So everyone's got a different way of doing this. 
uh, I'm just going to talk through how I did it. And then at the end, briefly say which direction I took from all this. So just a full warning, uh, I'm obviously going to be a bit biased on how I've gone through aerospace engineering and how it's been at the University of Birmingham for me. So everyone's experience of doing aerospace engineering could be very different. It's not a guarantee of how it will be for you, but hopefully this will be a good overview of some likely aspects of what it will be like. So first question, why would you want to be an aerospace engineer? So I'm going to put some reasons here and potential justifications for why you might want to be an aerospace engineer. So at Open Days, these are reasons people have given me, some I've had, and some my friends have had. And some of them are more relevant than others. Some may sound a bit weird, but others are more valid. So first of all, the big obvious one, you have an interest in aerospace. This is probably the most common reason why you want to be an aerospace engineer. It makes sense. Uh, maybe you've got an interest in, interest in planes, satellites, something like that. This is a very good justification for wanting to be an aerospace engineer because it's a good way to keep yourself motivated. Secondly, you want to work at NASA. What is a company in mind you really want to aim for or you think would be a really cool place to work at? Ultimately, you may not end up there in the long term, but it's a really good idea to have an idea of a company that you would think would be quite cool to work at. Maybe it's the uh, European Space Agency, UK Space Agency, whatever, but this is quite very good reason to have for doing aerospace engineering. Another one, I've had someone ask me this before, you want to go to space. So you really don't need to do an aerospace engineering degree to go to space. Uh, if you've got a degree, you can apply for the European Space Agency uh, astronaut program. So less of a reason to become an aerospace engineer, but still very relevant and it will be interesting to you. Uh, you want to be a pilot. This is a quite a common one that people actually have for doing aerospace engineering. Um, I'll be honest with you, there's more direct ways to become a pilot than doing aerospace engineering. But if, if you know it's something that's going to be of interest to you, it could be a really useful way to go with your career to do aerospace engineering and then pivot across. But I will stress that there is a lot more direct paths to go into being a pilot that might be more relevant to you. So I'd consider having a look at those instead, but still it's an interesting degree to do. Uh, also, you know you want to be an engineer, maybe you just find engineering interesting or you've got someone in your family that does engineering and you're just trying to select what type of engineering you want to do. And aerospace is a really good candidate for this because it's quite multidisciplinary. So this could be another reason. A couple more uh, in terms of jobs. So it's quite a respected career. That's always quite nice. And the job prospects are generally quite good. And now this final one, people don't really explicitly talk about, but it's money. So you can actually get quite a good wage being an aerospace engineer. But I will stress, if all you care about is money, don't do aerospace engineering. It's a lot of effort to just get some money at the end. There's a lot of other careers where you can just go make lots of money and do that instead. Definitely not the best way to motivate yourself, but it's quite nice. You will likely get a good wage being an aerospace engineer. So in terms of expectations, what do you really expect aerospace engineering is going to be like? Uh, so when I was applying for it, I should actually just be clear. When I was in college, I wasn't interested in an academic subject at university. I thought that sounded really boring. I was quite interested in product design and building things. And that's really what I wanted to do. But I got really lucky and happened to do a taster week similar to what Tara did. But this was at BAE Systems. And I went to that and I got to play around with some flight simulators for fighter jets. I got to try on night vision goggles and all this stuff. And I thought, yeah, this is really cool. This is what I wanted to do. So my expectations for this uh, and some that people will have in general, uh, maybe you'll be crawling around in jet engines, building planes, doing maintenance on them, being a mechanic, uh, lots of maths maybe. Uh, I didn't realize I haven't got my laser pointer on, that would help. Uh, maybe lots of maths, a bit of coding, uh, machining, 3D printing, being in a workshop. Uh, maybe you think you'll just design an aircraft in the afternoon, like randomly come up with a new plan for Airbus in an afternoon. It's not really how it works, but this is some one of the expectations I had a little bit. I thought maybe you just design a whole project yourself, but of course that's not true. There's hundreds, thousands of people working on these projects. And also another one, maybe you think 
by the end of an aerospace engineering degree, you're going to be able to make really good paper airplanes and show off to everyone how good you are. In all honesty, most aerospace engineers are pretty terrible at making paper airplanes, so this is no, not really a good expectation for what it's going to be like. But these are some ideas that I know a lot of my friends have had going into the degree. So what actually is aerospace engineering as a subject? So it's quite different to some of these. Uh, at the end of the day, it's an academic subject like physics or maths, and it's going to involve a lot of maths. That's kind of obvious, I hope. Uh, there's going to be a lot of theory. And this is because at the end of the day, engineering is just to find science and logic to solve big, difficult problems. So there's a lot of science and maths and stuff that goes behind it, but that shouldn't put you off by any means. So you obviously have to learn aerodynamics, material science, mechanics. So that way, when you're designing a wing for say, you know what material and what shape to make it. Uh, you'll do electrical engineering, work on the space environment, uh, look at propulsion systems. And these are all different areas that you'll probably touch on. And this is what I mean by you will be a very multidisciplinary engineer, which is really useful. And there'll be a lot of project management involved, coding, report writing and some practical work and to be honest like if I just tell you that it sounds really boring and it wouldn't be really useful to suggest the career to you and make it sound really boring because at the end of the day it's really not boring at all it's really interesting it's a really fun career to get involved with so coming on to what actually is an aerospace engineer at the end of the day you'll likely be solving big, really difficult problems related to aerospace. And you'll be applying the theory and knowledge you've learned to design solutions for really complex and convoluted problems that are actually pretty important in the world. So I've highlighted a couple over here. These are just kind of random thoughts I had. This top one, this is a big problem that uh, the School of Metal Metallurgy and Materials that the aerospace degree in uh, Birmingham is actually concerned with. So they've got a whole department with Rolls-Royce looking at this. So it's how do you design a part for a jet engine that can survive 1,700 degrees? And this is a difficult problem because there's not many materials that can actually survive that without just melting. So you actually have to get creative. So they actually cool down the jet engine blades with cold, what they call cold air. And it's actually 600 degrees, which isn't particularly cold by any means, but this is how they cool it. So you have to come up with all these innovative ways and tackle problems in non-obvious manners, which is quite interesting. And a lot of times you'll come across a problem and you won't know how to solve it or you won't have the skills to solve it. And a big part of being an engineer is you're able to go out and figure out how to learn and how to figure out the problem. So you'll quite often be given something, not have a clue how to do it, but a year later you've solved the problem and you're almost an expert on it, which is really rewarding. And of course, on all of these problems, say, how do you design a hypersonic aircraft? How do you get people to Mars? You don't work on it on your own. There's going to be thousands of people working on this and you work as a big team, which is really exciting. And you get to contribute your part of it, which could be small, it could be big, but it's all going to have a big importance as part of the team. And this final one, uh, it's not often spoken about, but as an engineer, you have to have to apply ethical judgment to the decisions you make. Because at the end of the day, there's going to be lots of people flying in the planes you're potentially designing. And if you've cut corners or you've tried to, say, maximize profit on one part, you've tried to make something thinner, cheaper, and it's not going to perform as well, you have to make an ethical judgment about, wait a minute, that's not suitable. You can't do that because people's lives will be at risk. And you're ultimately, as an accredited engineer, going to be responsible for this. So you have to be sure that you're making correct ethical judgments in the things you do. So this is what I think is really exciting about engineering is you get to work on these really big, interesting and exciting projects that actually make a difference. So Tara has briefly mentioned about the individual research project, which everyone does in the third year of university. So this is a big dissertation. You work on a project for about a year and you have to write about 4,000 words. It's a big project. It sounds quite scary, but it's quite enjoyable to do because it's a big bit of work that you spent a lot of time on. And this is your first opportunity to really dig into a problem. So you'll be doing research ahead of what's in the news and on Wikipedia, because 
what you see on Wikipedia is completely different to what's actually going on in the world of engineering and science. And most of the times it's a lot further, and a lot more up to date than what you can just see online very quickly. And this is where you'll do something novel. And what I mean by novel is someone's potentially never done this before. It's a problem that's not been tackled. And also it's really important. It's going to have a reason for why you're doing this project. You're not going to be doing a project that no one cares about. It's going to make a difference in the world and it's going to be useful for people. And this is where you'll start to realize in your career how wide, uh, far away from aerospace engineering you can actually go in terms of options. So the options we have on our offer here are pretty, pretty varied. So I've just got a few examples here. Uh, these are all ones that people have done at UOB, like some of my friends have done. Uh, so first of all, if you've got a problem with an aircraft, say your jet engine is too noisy, you can be running really high fidelity, cutting edge uh, aerodynamic simulations on computers. Maybe there's a part of aircraft performance that you need to investigate for a specific aircraft. You can do that on a flight simulator. Uh, maybe you want to develop a neural network to better improve the control or fuel efficiency of an aircraft. You could potentially be doing that. Uh, maybe you're more interested in space. You could be using data from satellites pulled down, maybe to model the environment they're in, or look at what's going on down at Earth using satellite data. A lot of this as well, you can be running all of this on massive supercomputers, uh, chugging away at all these problems, or conversely, you could just be using a wind tunnel. A lot more simple, but it still gives you a lot of insights. So this kind of gives you an idea for all the different projects you can be doing. And I'm just going to quickly talk about what my project was. So when I got it, I was quite surprised because I Googled it and this is what came up. And I was pretty shocked and disappointed because whilst it was my second choice, I was like, oh, I'm surely not going to get that. And if this is recognizable to some of you, this is an old radar that's in Chernobyl. It's very rusty. It's from the Cold War, built in the 60s. And my research project was on that. And I'm telling you about stuff being novel, interesting, and up to date. And this is what I got. And I was pretty disappointed. But that's because I was looking at Wikipedia. And turns out this type of radar, which is called over the horizon radar, was having a huge technological resurgence because computers are so much more powerful now. We can really harness this technology. So there's a lot of countries around the world trying to develop this again for the modern era. So that's all very well. This is radar, not particularly related to aerospace, but I was quite happy with this pivot away. And that's something that you can do with aerospace engineering. You can apply your skills to very different problems like this. But what caught me out as well is it wasn't just related to do with radars like this. My title was also the Northern Lights and Aurora slapped on top of it, which for me at first didn't make any sense. Like how did the Northern Lights have anything to do with this kind of radar? And this was a really fun journey over about a year of learning what the problems are. So the type of radar I was looking at is a very novel type of radar. And it uses a part of the upper atmosphere to reflect radio waves back down to the ground as, this, as in like a mirror, like shining a laser up to a mirror, bouncing it back down. So you can see beyond the horizon up to very far distances. And the part of the atmosphere that you can reflect off of uh, is also where the Northern Lights and Aurora are. And when Aurora are active, it can really, really mess up the performance, cause an absolute nightmare with this radar. And so my project was looking at how do we model it? What are the effects of Aurora on this type of radar? And how do you mitigate it? And you can see here one of the figures I made. Usually we want the radio waves to come up, be reflected by this big bright bit, and come straight back down to Earth. But when you get an Aurora, which is this small blob down here, we get all this weird stuff going on here, which is what the problem is. So this is what I was looking at for about a year. Um, this is all very well, but you'll quite often ask yourself, why does it matter? Why is it important? So this type of radar is really interesting because you can see out to ranges of about 3,500 kilometers. So this is for a hypothetical radar in North of Scotland. Uh, compared to a normal conventional radar, you can see about just under 500 kilometers, which is this green circle. So you can see this huge range of advantages why people are really interested in this type of radar and want to develop it. 
So it's really cost effective for monitoring remote areas. So as you can see from the UK with this kind of radar, you can see all the way out to the North Pole, even over Eastern Europe, over the oceans. So it's a really cost effective way for monitoring the airspace and monitoring ships. And another advantage of this is that you can, uh, it's got really good potential for early warning systems for hypersonic weapons. So if there's something launched really far off, say in the Arctic, it gives you a really, well, not a long period of time, but a lot more time to react to it versus if you only just detected it here. So there's a lot of reasons why this uh, type of radar was of interest to people and why it's being developed. So after a year of figuring out why it's important, I, I found a really great interest in this sort of stuff. And so from going from seeing a picture of rusty radars and the Northern Lights, it all makes a lot more sense to me now. And I feel really passionate and interested in this, which is a really nice thing of doing a university degree is you can find out what you're interested in. So another point where you'll uh, work on projects, as Tara said, is your fourth year group design project. <coughs> so again, this is going to be a year long project, uh, working on a big problem as a team. And this is your opportunity really to put into practice everything you've learned as part of your course. And you can do the option to make your project follow the Royal Aeronautical Society's competitions, which is what we chose to do. So there was a group of six or seven of us working on this for a whole year. It's quite intense, but it was really rewarding. So our challenge was you need to develop an aircraft that weighs less than 600 kilograms. It can land on really short runways and is able to perform humanitarian aid missions in the equatorial regions, which is a quite a difficult problem in itself. So you want to be landed on the side of mountains on really difficult runways, be able to deliver medical aid, perform medical evacuations, uh, deliver food and other humanitarian resources, which is a challenge in itself. Uh, and we were quite lucky because uh, we had a pilot who was flying in Papua New Guinea, performing exactly these roles. And he was able to talk us through what the missions entailed, showed us some videos of it, and that gave us really good context for this. But the real challenge of this problem was that it had to be electric. And um, I'm sure if any of you have looked into it, electric, well, batteries have very low energy density compared to jet fuel. So trying to get a plane to fulfill the same mission with nowhere near as much energy is a really hard challenge. So we spent a whole year trying to optimize this design, figure out how best we can do it. And this is the final renderings and pictures of the plane we designed. And ultimately we decided if we have rem removable batteries, almost as if you have AA batteries in the back of your TV remote, you can very quickly replace them when you want to take off again. You don't have to wait for your batteries to charge because you don't really want to do that when you're in the middle of nowhere uh, trying to evacuate someone. So this helped here and also it allows you to, if you want to carry something heavier, you can take out half your batteries and carry more mass with you. So this was quite an innovative solution that we were able to explore. What was quite nice as well, uh, we submitted it to this competition and we actually won, which was pretty cool. So we went to the Royal Aeronautical Society headquarters in central London and we went to the conference and presented our work. And we actually beat a team in Italy and a couple of other teams around the world, which was pretty exciting for us. Uh, so now coming on to another question, which is one of the big ones. Where do you actually go after university? So this is the real scary thing. You're finishing a degree, you've just walked out of the Great Hall, had a really long uh, degree ceremony. You walk out, you throw your cap in the air, it's all really exciting. It's also terrifying. You've just finished four years or three years of a degree. Now it's time to figure out what's going on. And at the end of the day, everyone does it very differently. Some people are lucky to have it figured out before they graduate. Other people haven't and they don't want to. And there's a couple of different pathways you can go with this. So you can do the classic route, get a job at an engineering company. Aerospace could be other type of engineering. You can do it that way. Or you can get a job in a different industry. So one of my friends, after three years, he was like, I'm so bored of aerospace engineering. I hate it. I don't ever want to do it again. So he went and did a career in finance. And honestly, very few people have that opinion at the end of aerospace engineering, but that was just how he felt about it. What was nice is with the skills you pick up in the aerospace degree, you can actually pivot away and do something else at the end, which is quite cool. And as I originally wanted to do product design, 
it was quite nice to know that one of my friends actually went away and did a job in product design because that's what he was interested in. So it was quite nice to know that even if I had decided after all this, I wanted to do product design, I still could pivot away and do that, which is quite nice to know. And also there's these other two options down the bottom here. So you could do what Tara is currently planning to do, have a gap year, figure out what you want to do, because at the end of the day, four years of a degree is pretty exhausting. You want some time to figure out what's going on. And this is quite a good time in your life to have a gap year and figure out what you're going to do. Or you can do the slightly more rogue choice and do a PhD. And this is actually what I decided to do. That's why I'm still at university, even though I've graduated. So I'm currently here doing a PhD. So I'm just going to talk briefly here. Why? Where did I go with all of this? This is the final question. I should be near the end now. Sorry, I've realized this is quite a long presentation. So in terms of my next steps, uh, I found a really strong interest, as I said, in this radar and this research project I did. So I was actually really lucky and got offered a paid summer research position with the Space Environment and Radio Engineering Group with my supervisor. So I got to do that between my third year and fourth year. And this was quite weird because I'd worked a lot of part-time jobs, working in cafes, working in Morrison's. And this was the first time that I was really getting paid for my knowledge that I'd accrued through my degree and applying my expertise to a problem. So this was pretty cool for me. And I was quite lucky. I managed to publish my work from this third year project into an international scientific journal on the matter. And here's the picture of it here. I was pretty excited about it at the time. This is pretty cool, I thought. And this is ultimately what made me decide to do a PhD, which going from not wanting to do an academic subject at university, wanted to do product design, to now doing a PhD, it's really weird looking back because I never would have thought this was what I would be doing now. But for some reason, here I am, whatever. But this is what I'm doing. So yeah, I decided to do a PhD. Uh, and now I'm pretty lucky. I've been, I'm in the process of traveling around the world, going to some international conferences. So I've been to the Canadian Space Agency in Montreal, Canada at the start of this year. Uh, I'm going to Japan in August, which is coming around really quickly, which is quite scary. And now I'm actually working on a multi-million pound radar project for the UK Defence, which is the same radar I was talking about before. And uh, we're developing this as part of our research group. And of other really exciting places I went as part of my PhD was Rainy Devon in January this year. This, this was field trials for the antennas we were building. It was pretty miserable. Devon in January is rainy, horrible and cold. But this is part of doing engineering. You will go on field trials at some point. If it's sunny, it's quite nice. If it's rainy, pretty cold and miserable. But still, it's the fun part of it. And uh, I've been presenting uh, my work to DSTL, which is the Defence Science and Technology Laboratory. They do a lot of high-end defence research for the UK. And we've also been presenting our work to the Missile Defence Centre. So it's pretty nice to see how a university research project can actually translate into real work, which is really exciting. And I'm, I feel very lucky that I've been able to find an interest of mine and go with it and follow it as a career, which is really exciting. So just to summarize here, uh, aerospace engineering can offer some pretty wildly different opportunities for you. And it involves a lot more than just planes. If you want to do just planes, you can do that. But there's so many other things you can explore with that because you have the skill set to pivot into different careers. And it's really exciting because you get to work on big projects that really matter and make a difference. And you're pushing science forward. And you get to work on things that you find interesting, which is really nice. And say, if you're like my friend, you decide you don't like it and you want to pivot to a different career, at the end of the day, you can go into a lot of different other careers, which is quite nice. So uh, that's all from me. I realized that was quite long and I probably spoke quite quickly, but yeah, thanks for listening. And I'm going to be hanging around for any questions you may have. So yeah, thank you. Josh, that's absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you, Tara and Josh, because I think what that does is really kind of embed um, the learning in a far more sort of uh, realistic setting as well, because I think both of you have worked on sort of these live projects and they're not just theory. Uh, they are things that actually influence, um, you know, long term aims and objectives of real life projects. And that's really exciting. And um, if 
any students have um, any questions whilst uh, I'm talking and uh, we'll ask Tara and Josh those pre-asked questions, but do type in uh, the chat anything that anybody would like to ask. Um, we did have some uh, couple of questions beforehand, if I may. If you had one piece of advice to your younger self, what would it be? Tara, can I ask you that one first? God, I, I definitely didn't know what I wanted to do I think as I said someone just said engineering was a good thing um I think maybe definitely do your research as to what you want to do I think look at if you want to go to university look at the type of place and also the modules on offer I know I've hit UAB because they did space one year before the other university I was looking at and that's why I picked it um, but I think just go with it. You will get knocked down. You will fail at some point. It's like applying for jobs, applying for university, applying for work experience. You will get rejected, but just go with it and everything will work out in the end. I think that's the best. That's great. And, and it isn't always um, it doesn't always go your way when you're applying for these things. And I think sometimes it's quite difficult then to pick yourself back up. But actually, most of the time, something different comes along. And I think it is taking a chance, isn't it, as well? And, and that's really good advice. Josh, have you got anything that you would recommend to students? Yeah, I guess. So when I was picking my careers, as I said, I wanted to do product design. I was I thought, oh, my God. This is the point where I decide how my entire life is going to pan out. I choose this subject and this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And honestly, it's really not like that. Like if you do a career such as engineering, you can move away, do some other things, which is really nice. So don't think that it's the only thing you're going to have to do for the rest of your life. There's a lot more that you can do, which is quite nice. That's super. Um, and Tara, can I ask you as well, the kinds of skills that uh, students might be able to build? Um, you talked a bit about your work experience in year 12, which I think was really interesting and very relevant to current students. But is there anything that students could be thinking about, could be actually doing or developing uh, or any interest they could be following that might give them some ideas with engineering in general as well as aerospace? Um, I think a lot of the things I've done, I've kind of picked up through university. Um, I've done a fair bit of volunteering. So I, this previous year, I worked for the events and projects team for UK SADS, the UK Students Exploration and Development uh, for Space, um, something along those lines, I always forget. Um, but they're always hiring volunteers and they're really interesting. Um, charity to work for they do a big conference every year and that student run and it is mainly students it's a great place to have contacts I think when I was in sixth form I went to a lot of I think I did actually end up going to a graduate uh, career event by accident but I think that was nice for everyone there because they were not just saying the same spiel over and over again and I think for me like I when I was there they had the bloodhound car which is the fastest land vehicle um, and that again was just a bit of a wow uh, seeing it in person I think seeing something in person and getting hands-on experience um, or just speaking to different companies and seeing what they offer because a lot of the things you don't realize are on offer or are out there and I think that is one of the best things that you can do that's great, that's great. Josh, have you got any idea on, on any other ideas on skills or anything that students could be doing? Yeah, so one of the skills I would say, it's not an obvious skill, but it's finding your curiosity within what you're interested in. So during college, something I found that was quite useful and through my whole degree was going to like uh, presentations and talks put on by these big uh, organisations. So the Royal Aeronautical Society, uh, the Institute of Electrical Engineers and Technicians. So I went to a couple of those. I, it was quite fun. So there was some that were free in central London and they had these big events on free food and drink on this big balcony overlooking London, which was really cool to go to. But the stuff they were talking about was really interesting. And it's really useful for, just as you're going into your career, finding what you find interesting. Because at the end of the day, 
engineering and science is so much bigger than you ever think it is until you start. So trying to figure out what you find interesting is really useful. That's really good. And I think actually the concept of being curious is something that we want all students to think about because that curiosity takes you off in different directions and you don't know until you try, do you? And I think probably, um, you know, taking those interesting uh, podcasts and TED Talks is great, but actually going and attending a live presentation in person. Um, and I know when, uh, when Tara spoke about you know doing the 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 Formula One car and things like that. I remember going to UOB and seeing students who'd been up all night, you know, building a car ready to race it and everything. It, there was nothing quite like the atmosphere and the power. It was palpable that they were excited and they'd been, you know, solving problems. And I think actually encountering people in this way and getting excited about. Um, not learning and knowledge and different areas is is great. Um, the other thing I would would ask about is that value of work experience and connecting with people. Um, you know, we use LinkedIn here. Is there anywhere that you can tell students that they could sort of best link with people, and network? Um, I think before university, I definitely hadn't networks that much um i think having some work experience when you're coming to university is good and like helps with summer placements if that's what you're applying for because it just gives you something more to talk about but i think networking definitely comes with time um i think on my placement i went to quite a few conferences um and just met people there and i think there's like there's the space Tom expo that was at Farnborough a few weeks ago they run that every year um there's Farnborough air show that you can go to um i think just if you know roughly what you're interested in or even if you don't if you go to some of these big exhibitions you can just have a walk around and speak to people everyone is so friendly and if you do just say oh do you mind if i could uh add you on linkedin in case i have a message or anything everyone is very open to doing that like because for them they're looking at who they're going to employ in the employ in the future um but i think that's the best thing with networking like don't think oh they're a ceo i can't speak to them um one conference i went to i just sat at a random table because i didn't know anyone and it was the ceo of satellite um like catapult satellite up um and I just kind of sat there and I was like, oh, I'm just a placement student. Uh, <laughs> and you do just kind of have those interactions. But I think that's what's good about just going to lots of different things and meeting lots of people. That's really helpful. Josh, have you got anything to add to that? Yeah, so I would also say, don't worry too much about your network until later on. You'll build it with time. But LinkedIn is also really useful. So it's quite a good history of what you've done. So if you've got like a small achievement like you've been to a taste of the week and you found it interesting or you've done a small project or read an interesting article it's quite good to put on there because it's almost like your history of what's interesting about you so it's quite useful to do that but yeah also just when you go to events talk to people like you've, even if nothing comes of it long term you'll find out some really interesting things from these people it's really good to get insights from them so yeah i'd say don't worry too much about building your network early on because it will come but make use of what people have to say because it's really interesting. That's great. And we actually on the 4th of October have a careers convention here. We'll be having employers from a range of different professions. And I think it'll be really interesting for students to be able to go around that and ask questions. And there will be a variety of people, hopefully from engineering as well. So that would be very useful. And um, Faye's been really busy um, putting in uh, links, which have been absolutely great. And uh, for students, you'll be able to see these links as you've been part of the recording. So. 
but we will send these round and we will send round the presentations that uh, Tara and Josh uh, have, have uh, conducted today. So that's brilliant. Um, perhaps as we haven't got any further questions at the moment, um, perhaps both of you, if you don't mind, if we get any further questions, if, if students don't want to ask right now, we can forward those on to you. Um, it's been really interesting and I think both of you have come things from different angles and actually that's been very exciting I think to hear and also just to see the, the sort of theory and how it translates into live projects um, and actually you know the significance of the things that you can be working on throughout those years in theory at university and the international travel and all of that that comes with it is really exciting. Um, can I say thank you very much on behalf of Faye and myself and the college to Tara and to Josh for coming along with us today and to all of you students who've been staying on. We've kept everybody on here, which is wonderful. We will send around the recording afterwards and we do thank you very much indeed for your time. We wish you very much um, a bright future and we look forward to keeping track of you if you if we may as you kind of go on to your next steps as well. Um, there is a feedback form uh, for students that you can complete um, and Faye's just put the link to that. We will send that round afterwards as well. And thank you very much. I hope everybody's enjoyed this evening. I shall be staying on camera, I think, uh, for just a short while. But everybody else, thank you very much indeed for joining us. And thanks, Tara and Josh. Okay. Good night to everyone. Yeah, thanks for having us and thanks thank for everyone you. for us then. Thank you. Cheers. Uh,